Hello and welcome to Polysop Book Club. We're still uh, reading through Bartram to Juvenile's On Power, The Natural History of Its Growth. So last time we were talking about how power is an expansionist by the nature of its egoism, uh, but it wants to preserve itself at all times so that it can expand. So it ends up ca like caring for or uh, attending to administering what it's already expanded to. Um, today we're going to talk about how political rivalry works as we finish up the section on the nature of power in this book. Um, of political rivalry in this area, there are multiple powers within a state, a power, but there is a supreme power, right? The state. But there are also other supreme powers in other states. For example, we could say that France is a supreme power as well as Germany, especially, you know, as Europe has developed through the modern age. Um, but our states, our recognized states, are all our supreme powers. And these powers are in rivalry with each other. So not only do you have the supreme power with multiple rival smaller powers within that supreme power, you have a rivalry between supreme powers. So between states, you know, between countries and their interests and everything like that. So the juvenile is going to start off with uh, a question in this section saying, is war alien to modern times? So is war uncommon? Is war, um, you know, something foreign and, and exotic and, and just not familiar to modern times? Well, he's writing in like the late 40, 1940s, and he's going to be like, are you kidding? Of course war is not alien to our mind. We just had two world wars. And look at all the other wars. If you go back to modernity, when what the beginning of modernity is, about the time of the establishment of nation states through the Treaty of Westphalia, you still see constant wars and everything. Constant needs for power to grow and everything. So power has this instinct for growth. And though power changes its forms through all this history, it still is growing no matter what the form is that it changes to. For example, you know, like we had, you know, feudal kings that gave rise to absolute monarchies that gave rise to republics that, you know, and power has expanded through all of these. So the first thing he's going to talk about is a self-militarizing civilization. Now, he doesn't mean exactly that we are just constantly looking for war and, like, constantly militarizing ourselves. But he's saying that as we advance, as our technology advances, as we just move on through the time, everything will have, can eventually be absorbed into the war machine. And he uses an example like... Um, Russian train expansion, railroad expansion. Well, that railroad expansion might have taken place in a time of peace, but when war came around, that railroad expansion was incorporated into the war machine. So he's saying that like everything in a society can be militarized. So as we self determine our, our and we uh, develop civilization and as it moves along the track it everything that is newly developed or or you know innovated or anything like that will eventually be uh, pulled into the war machine so then he's going to move on to 
the law of political rivalry is what he calls it. The law of political rivalry. So remember, everything can be involved in militarizing our uh, civilizations. Every advancement, everything like that. Um, but the law of political rivalry is that when your neighbor does something, you have to respond in kind to keep up or else you are going to die as a power. So power, you know, constantly wants to preserve and expand. Well, if it's not expanding, then it is losing out to what its neighbor is doing and can and is vulnerable to being extinguished. So that's the law of political rivalry that, you know, it's like keeping up with the Joneses all the time. And I think of it um, the way a professor once explained the... Uh, the Cold War to me about how, you know, let's say I walked in and put a gun down in front of you. And then the next day you walked in and put a bigger gun down and was like, it's just, we both said it's just for self-defense. Well, then I needed to come up with a bigger gun and a bigger gun and then a bomb and everything like that. So we're just constantly in this rivalry, whatever your rivals, um, and even cooperative rivals, right? You don't have to actively be in conflict with them. You could be trading partners, you could be anything, but whatever they do, you'll need to do too. Uh, and that's where he's going to lead into the advance of power is the advance of war. The advance of war is the advance of power. So he uses war a lot in this, but I think you can just think of anything that the government takes over. And I'll, I'll kind of expand on that in a minute. But the advance of power... So what he's going to say is this advance of power and advance of war and advance of war, advance of power. It's saying that once we start this political rivalry and this keeping up with each other, it's not going to stop. It, it's going to, because power is expansionist, because it makes war with uh, competing powers and everything, because everything can be adopted into war, it's all advanced is going to eventually be in service of war, of rivalry, of conflict, and everything. And in turn, that rivalry and conflict is going to expand the power. Now, like, let's say two countries went to war and one of them, like, completely got obliterated. That actually expands the power of one, right? It expands the whole power of one and diminishes another. So whether power is successful in expanding or not does not may mean that it's not always trying to expand and advance its own power through rivalry, conflict, war, whatever you want to say. So then he starts to illustrate what he means. And he's going to go through about six different stages different turning points and different, you know, like, like choke points, I guess, that you could, you could identify, uh, as illustrating this power, this advance of power, advance of war, advance of power, advance of war, or advance of war, advance of power kind of thing. So he's, the first one is from the feudal army to the royal army. So early on, uh, you know, after, as Europe was in the Dark Ages or whatever, we had this feudal system, this this mass feudal system of fiefdoms and serfs and lords, and the aristocracy ran things. And the aristocracy was who fought the battles, right? The king might have been the king, but the aristocracy held just as much power. And this aristocrat could go fight this aristocrat, the king could be on that side, so then two aristocrats, you know, like, they constantly competed with each other, and just because you were the king, it didn't acknowledge your supreme power, it just acknowledged that you were uh, a certain kind of noble in this type of thing. Maybe a little bit elevated of a noble over the other nobles, but the aristocracy was what fought all the battles, and the people never were involved in war, the common people, unless war came through where they lived, right? If you were a farmer and, you know, on the fiefdom and your lord 
got attacked by another lord well you were probably weren't gonna you probably weren't gonna fare very well in that uh but typically the regular people the especially the serfs and everything didn't really get caught up in war but then he's gonna say that as these wars continued and the need for war then you had the king starting to impose taxation and start and where the way taxation started was a request right and then it became a demand so the king was the power but he was a weak power in the feudal system and then he started requesting from the aristocracy and and this aristocrat's like sure i'll help you out i'll help you out and then you know the king he helps the king out and the king grows the power of the king of the state grows greater and all of a sudden it's like hey remember how you helped me out last time yeah you're gonna help me out again and so is he and so is he because we have to fight this huge dude like and if we're not if you don't help me out we're going to disappear right we need to preserve our existence so i'm taking this from you and i'm taking this from you and i'm taking this from you so that we all can stay alive and existing so that process leads from feudalism feudal armies that are very small and aristocratic and everything give rise to those being absorbed into a royal army where it's still those same people fighting but now they're more centralized uh they're they're not fighting each other they're they're more centralized in fighting larger centralized powers too that are rivals to the state that they're all under the state uh usually this would be called the realm back then but the state the king's realm um so then he says the war that war is the midwife of absolute monarchy so what he means by that is that a midwife like helps birth something right so war through this process of taxation allows the king to eventually have a standing army and that standing army is that royal army that he talks about so the royal army then gives the king that much more authority to exercise this dominion over these aristocrats and not just the aristocrats but everybody under these aristocrats too and you develop this concept of absolute monarchy the king gets so powerful that they that nothing can can interfere with that king's power that monarch's power and you end up with with things like henry the eighth and you end up with louis the 14th and all these different monarchs that we see as like absolute monarchs under the ancient regime so then he's going to talk about like okay so you have these absolute monarchs well the powers of international rivalry then come into play where this process of keeping up with the joneses really starts to pick up so the king of country a that is next door to country b they're rivals and country a gets a standing army so country b gets a standing army well country a the king takes complete control over uh the the state for efficiency purposes and that makes them more able to do war than country b so country b has to keep up and so the king becomes the absolute monarch there uh, through this natural process and you start to see through this process that more and more and more people are able to be drawn into this pro this conflict process this expansionist process the armies of the feudal system were tiny compared to the armies of the uh absolute monarchies could draw up well then you get this concept of conscription coming in this is another expansion of power to maintain these standing armies you have to have people so the state is able to compel people to join the army to keep this standing army well one state introduces conscription 
and another state then has to introduce conscription to keep these standing armies, to keep these numbers going. You know, because you have to match in kind the power there. So then you get this era of cannon fodder around the, uh, you know, 17, 1800s, especially Napoleonic Wars and everything, cannon fodder. They would call up tens of thousands of soldiers and just march them the fuck out and just get them blown the hell. And, you know, and it was just like... There was nothing that they wouldn't sacrifice for the state. Now people could just were just expendable to the state. You were drawing more and more of the people in, and not just the people, but the resources of of the state. Not just the people to as physical fighters, but also, you know, new weapons, new energies, new um new foods, new, uh, you were starting to just bring all this development and absorb it into the state's power to make war until you get to this whole process of total war. And total war is what we saw in the late 1800s and especially during World War I and World War II where not only were there armies in the field and supply lines and everything, but people back in the homeland like were also in the war effort. The entire society was mobilized to war. And it, it really doesn't have to be just war. It can be all the developments of society. Power is going to expand to administer over what, is developed in its society, right? So in these world wars, we had complete mobilization of our populations for war. Because Germany mobilized the entire German state from the minutia up to the grandios uh, for war, England had to do that. Russia had to do that. And the U.S. had to do that. France failed to do that, and they got fucking obliterated, right? They were not able to mobilize as quickly as the Germans had their whole population, and they ended up getting, you know, almost eliminated, almost being, you know, New Germany. Um, You have just this massive expansion of war and power. And it doesn't mean that war is just constant, like always, that there's no peacetime or anything like that. It just means that everything in society can be mobilized. So let's think about this. So like, as we move on and we develop, well, there are less soldiers that you need, actual soldiers, because we're developing more advanced weapons of all time. So, you know, a Navy SEAL team, right, uh, in 2024 could probably take out a good portion by themselves of an entire Napoleonic army, an entire army just a couple hundred years ago. Even our, like, what we think of like these, I don't want to say primitive, but like, let's say like Al Qaeda or like the Taliban or something, the weapons that they have would be able to use way less people to accomplish way more than these massive armies. So you're having a, a constriction of actual personnel needed for these armies as the power of the weapons expand. So that's what we're seeing right now in our process of total war. We're not seeing people just added to the army like all the time and conscripted in. Uh, I'm Not that we couldn't see that, but what we're seeing is a constant advance of militar of militarization. And that is having the largest, most advanced military and everything is 
one of the major reasons that the U.S. is the sole superpower in the world, the way that it is. The <laughs> That's just how it is because the army is so massive. So that is this influence of political rivalry on how power expands and how it operates in society under its egoist, this dialectic of command, this need to expand, but also to administer. So in the first part of the book, he said, power administers to conquer and conquers to administer. So that's basically just saying that power regulates and moves society to expand and conquer more of a society. And as it conquers, it administers what it conquers to further expand and everything. It's like this this loop of things that just, you know, start out as a small circle, right? Small centralizing circle, and it just slowly absorbs and absorbs and absorbs and absorbs. And thus, no matter whether you switch from a monarchy to a republic to like a liberal democracy the way that we have as these countries that we're talking about have developed, all these states have developed, no matter the form, the power has still expanded. The total mobilization of society has only been possible under more equal and more expanded and more free, in theory, societies that we now live in and that we now inhabit, when you compare them to what has come in the past, even just a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, especially 500 years ago, that the power of the state has completely expanded to proportions that people in the past could never even imagine. And they had expanded further than people before them could ever even imagine. So that's how political rivalry influences the expansion of power. Next time, we're going to start a new section. Um, this one is one of my favorites, actually. And it probably is, you know, uh, going to be... Um, liked by revolutionaries, I guess. But it's the state as permanent revolution. So it's talking about the state, you know, through this expansion process and everything, it's constantly reinventing itself, constantly doing more and more and changing forms as it expands its power. All right. Thank you for watching. I'm Kayla of Cave Kayla. Like and subscribe for more PoliSci Book Club episodes.